Good morning, everyone. I'm Olivia Chapla, Astrobotics Director of Marketing and Communications, and welcome to our Telecon for Peregrine Mission One's review board. We appreciate your inquiries, and for some of you, your patience, as we comprehensively investigated and assessed each aspect of the mission. At the, at the conclusion of this call, a report of Peregrine's review board findings will be published at astrobotic.com slash press. We will also be sending out an e-blast to all of you. Now, today's briefing will serve as an informational session concerning the Peregrine spacecraft's in-space journey, our approach to investigating and assessing the mission's anomaly, and a path forward for future missions. Experts joining the call today from Astrobotic are John Thornton, the founder and CEO, Sharad Baskaran, Mission Director for Peregrine Mission One, Steve Clark, Vice President of Landers and Spacecraft. Also joining us today is Dr. John Horak, Professor and Neil Armstrong Chair for Ohio State University and the Board Chair for Astrobotics Peregrine Review Board. First, we'll start with some initial remarks from our briefers before taking questions. To add your name to our question queue, please message the Zoom Calls Q&A box with both your name and your organization. And now we'll start off by hearing from Astrobotics founder and CEO, John Thornton. Thanks, Olivia. Um, just to review first that this was Astrobotics first mission. Uh, Peregrine was flying and attempting to land on the surface of the moon. The first mission that took off and launched from Florida uh, under the CLPS initiative. Launch occurred on January 8th at 2.18 a.m. on the ULA Vulcan launch vehicle. It was a beautiful, beautiful flight. Um, so exciting. It was a, a real high um, to get to that point, to have so many years of, of work and effort culminating in that moment on that launch. And to see it successfully fly was, was truly thrilling. Um, once we were in space uh, and released from Vulcan, we, we started to initiate our, our spacecraft. We turned on the avionics and the power management system and established communication with astrobotic mission control um, via uh, NASA's deep space network. And that all was successfully accomplished at around uh, an hour after launch. Uh, and then the next phase was to start commissioning the, the propulsion system. So Par Peregrine, <clears throat> excuse me, Peregrine's propulsion system was activated. Um, this involved pressurizing the fuel and oxidizer tanks with helium from the pressurant tank by opening two uh, pressure control valves. We're going to call those PCVs for the uh, duration here. So PCV1 and PCV2 are the two pressure control valves that uh, control that helium. Upon actuating, opening, and closing the PCV2, helium began to flow uncontrollably into the oxidizer tank, and that caused a significant and rapid overpressure pressurization of the tank. Uh, unfortunately, the tank then ruptured and subsequently leaked oxidizer for the remainder of the mission. Um, shortly after uh, the, the event, this, the team was able to stabilize the spacecraft, um, and that was uh, quite challenging because the ACS was not designed for that kind of impulse that we were getting from the leak of the tank. Um, but we were able to stabilize, and then we were able to turn to the, to the sun, uh, charge the batteries, and, and uh, proceed with the mission. Uh, we were able to gather the prop data um, through the course of the subsequent next days. We were also able to turn on uh, payloads and power uh, every one of the powered uh, payloads that were on board the mission. Um, and we got a, a tremendous amount of data uh, and information about how the spacecraft flies, as well as all of our payloads um, in, in the uh, uh, orbit um, environment. So we uh, obtained a, a lot of data about our systems and advanced the TRL system, uh, TRL uh, ratings for multiple parts of the subsystems of the, of the lander. Uh, and ultimately, this, this lander is capable of flying in space. And that, that's a really, really big accomplishment for the team. Uh, as we all know, ultimately, the malfunction did inhibit our ability to, to land on the surface of the moon. We just didn't have enough fuel. Uh, and pressure needed to land on the surface. So uh, all in all, we operated about 10 and a half days in space. We traveled more than 535,000 miles. Um, since the conclusion of the mission, uh, there's been two science teams that have published science data from the science that was actually collected while the payloads were operating. And we understand that, that a third team intends to publish imminently uh, relating to radiation environment. Um, around uh, uh, around the mid of the mission, we were deciding what to do with the spacecraft, and in consultation with NASA, uh, we, we made the, the very difficult decision to return the spacecraft back to Earth for a controlled re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we, we landed at an open uh, spot over open water in the South Pacific on January 18th at uh, around 4.04 p.m. Eastern. 
Um, after the conclusion of the mission, uh, we, we quickly assembled an expert board. Uh, we did that very quickly to make sure that any knowledge that wasn't written down already was uh, was at everybody's fingertips. Um, we uh, we recruited Dr. John Horak, who was on this call uh, and graciously uh, has joined us here um, to lead that effort. And we took a look at ourselves, took a look at all of our processes, the technical side, um, and we're going to hear some of those results imminently here. So back to Olivia. Thanks, John. And next up, we'll hear from Dr. John Horak, Professor and Neil Armstrong Chair for Ohio State University and the Board Chair for Astrobotics Peregrine Review Board. John, you're on. Well, thank you, Olivia. Yeah, thank you. And good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is John Horak. I currently serve uh, in the position of the Neil Armstrong Chair at Ohio State, which is a joint appointment between Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and the College of Engineering and the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, a job I've had the pleasure of having since 2016. A bit of my background, some of you have had a chance to work with uh, before, or at least communicate during the time I was at NASA. My professional career in space flight started in July of 1987 at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Spent 17 years at NASA in two separate stints. The first stint as a, a PhD gamma ray astrophysicist and uh, helped build the uh, satellite called the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory and, and lots of other work. I left to start a software company. I did that for five years. I uh, went back to NASA, ran the Science and Mission Systems Office at NASA Marshall, which was an SES position. I then went to become the Vice President for Research at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, did that for four years. And then prior to coming to Ohio State, I served as the Vice President for Space Systems at Taliban Brown Engineering, where I had p &L responsibility for <laughs> the uh, space work that was done at, at Teledyne Brown. So it was an honor to be asked to, to uh, serve as the uh, independent chairman of the Peregrine Review Board. That review board was nearly three dozen people, I believe 35 people in total, uh, 26 of whom were inter internal multidisciplinary subject matter experts who knew the Peregrine hardware and the vehicle better than anyone else. We also had eight external volunteers uh, and private contractors who came recommended by NASA and other uh, members from our space industry networks. So I had the chance uh, and the pleasure of working with the team. I uh, spent a number of days in Pittsburgh uh, in person on several trips, uh, working as they analyzed all the data, uh, both from the flight itself, but also all the data leading up to the flight, uh, qualification testing on, on various components, um, you know, results of environmental tests, and then also uh, after the after the space flight itself to go through the data. Um, this was a very rigorous review process. Um, we uh, The team used a, a, a root cause analysis method called, called causal condition methodology, which is con consistent with industry-wide aerospace standards in terms of how you get to the bottom of why something happened. Uh, John Thornton des described what happened, but the question is why. And after an extensive review of the events, you know, before, during, and after the mission, the board concluded that the most likely cause of the malfunction was indeed a failure of a single helium pressure control valve, John mentioned, uh, called PCV, pressure control valve two, within the propulsion system. And PCV2 suffered a loss of seal capability that was most likely due to a mechanical failure in the valve caused by vibration induced relaxation between some threaded components that are inside the valve. So a failure deep inside the, the valve itself. Now, among the many reasons that, that we, uh, the board came to that conclusion is that the, the spacecraft is always talking to you when it's flying, it's sending back uh, large amounts of telemetry things like temperature data, roll rates, which tell you not only where is the spacecraft pointed, but how fast is it rolling around any one of the three axes, tank pressure data, and other things. And these, these telemetry data pinpointed both the location and the timing of the mission anomaly, which coincided with the position on the system of the pressure control valve itself and the autonomous sequence to open and close the PCV. So the spacecraft data were very consistent with a, with a tank failure near the top of the tank. And as I said before, uh, the PCV2 loss, uh, loss, loss of seal capability was due to a mechanical failure in the valve. So I'll stop there. I'll hand it back to you, Olivia, and uh, we'll be looking forward to your questions after a few other comments. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next up, we have Sharad Bhaskaran, Mission Director for Peregrine Mission One. 
Good morning, everybody. This is Sherrod. I'm the mission director. I've been the Peregrine mission director for eight years, starting really when we began the requirements for, for the program. Uh, prior to Astrobotic, I was with Lockheed Martin working on shuttle, NASA Mir, and space station programs. <clears throat> So um, to confirm, uh, the replic we replicated the failure mode, uh, the valve failing to seat, which will properly uh, through terrestrial testing. We did with the spare flight PCV. Uh, we subjected to similar flight conditions. We subjected the valve to qualification level shock and vibe, pressurized cycling, and a final seat force and measured the internal leak, leak rate. After cycling under pressurization, the spare PCV began leaking at a rate that was roughly equivalent to that observed during PM1 space operations. We, we disassembled the valve. We showed that the uh, threaded joint on the valve was loosened and an O-ring in the valve had been damaged along with the along the ceiling surface. So uh, adding here some content context is what led to us selecting this particular uh, component. In July tonight, uh, 2019, after we won CLIPS uh, TO2, we made the decision to outsource the propulsion systems development to an outside vendor. We did go through a competitive selection process um, and and they executed uh, a a space spaceflight proven uh, process with industry standards in development. Uh, but in fall 2021, uh, as COVID was affecting supply chains, uh, they were suffering some uh, some schedule issues and technical issues, and these were compromising our mission schedule, and really jeopardized the next stages of our spacecraft integration and, and launch readiness. So in early 22 2022. We made a decision to pull the uh, propulsion system in-house, uh, partly assembled, um, and to complete it our, on our own schedule to give us more schedule uh, certainty and confidence. Um, we, by this time, we'd already uh, made the decision to do Griffin propulsion systems in-house, the development in-house to do more vertical integration. So we'd already uh, developed a lot of the capabilities to do that propulsion integration. So we started doing that on Peregrine or finished Peregrine with that. And this also burned down some uh, some of the risk uh, going to the Griffin program, which is far more complex than Peregrine. As we were doing the assembly of the propulsion feed system uh, through April and November of 2022, we started encountering issues uh, with some of the components in particular. Uh, the PCVs uh, that you've already heard about um, were starting to have some uh, leak issues. And so we continued to try to resolve the issues um, but we already made commitments to go to uh, acceptance testing for the spacecraft level and, of course, uh, committing to launch dates. Um, so in August 2022, we made the decision to pivot, pivot to an alternate uh, valve supplier. And this is the same uh, supplier that was already providing pyrotechnic valves uh, for Peregrine. So once we put the new valves in and installed them, uh, we conducted a final set of leak, uh, leak and proof tests on the propulsion system itself. This is where we encountered leaks with PCV-1, which was the PCV controlling helium into the fuel tanks. PCV-2 uh, did not encounter any leaks at this stage. Uh, and so since PCV-1 uh, was easily, easily accessible, uh, we repaired it uh, and passed the final round of proof testing. Um, and then we completed assembly of the spacecraft, including what we call level two integration of all the elements of the avionics and electronics and everything else was added to the spacecraft. Um, and then we took the entire spacecraft through a rigorous acceptance test campaign, vibration, acoustics, thermal vacuum, and electromagnetic interference and compatibility testing. Um, after all the testing, which was uh, completely successful, we still carried PCV2 as a risk in our risk register uh, because of the repairs that PCV1 had required during the during the proof and leak testing. Um, but we deemed that the PCV2 failing was low, the likelihood of failing was low because we had passed acceptance testing and it, it and it never experienced any leaks during that testing PCV2. Um, so we did identify the risk. Again, as I mentioned, we carried as low likelihood, uh, but it's also the case that PCV2, as opposed to PCV1, was located much farther inside the spacecraft, and to access it to do repairs or replace it would have required extensive surgery on the spacecraft to take out key elements, large elements of the spacecraft, which would have invalidated 
the acceptance testing that we had just completed. And these are very time consuming and expensive tests. So that along with the risk of doing damage uh, if we had deintegrated and reassembled the spacecraft led us uh, to the conclusion that uh, it was best to proceed um, to the next stage of uh, of the program um, and and not to replace PCV2 and to proceed to flight. All right. Thank you, Sherrod. And a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions. Um, we'll have Q&A in just a few moments. Uh, but first up, we are going to hear from Steve Clark, Astrobotics Vice President of Landers and Spacecraft. Thank you, Olivia, and good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who I haven't worked with in the past or talked with, um, I have about 40 years experience in the space and aeronautics communities. Uh, which is actually hard for me to believe at this point. But uh, I started my career out at the Kennedy Space Center on the Space Shuttle Program, uh, worked in the Launch Services Program. Um, I had a 23-year career with NASA at uh, Kennedy and at headquarters, working in human space flight, the Science Mission Directorate, and uh, finally the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. Um, so on top of my executive leadership in systems engineering program management experience, I have a background in spacecraft and launch vehicle systems, including propulsion. Um, I came on board with Astrobotic a little over four months ago, um, and I'm really excited to be part of this team uh, here in Pittsburgh. So um, I, I have to share with you, as soon as I came on board here, um, I got to know the team and, and found that we have a, a very committed and highly motivated team that is uh, determined to make uh, GM1, Griffin Mission 1, a success. Um, they have their heads down coloring and working hard to, to make that a reality. And I'm, I'm very excited to be leading uh, this team here to do just that. Um, talking about uh, Peregrine Review Board findings that John Horak walked through, um, Part of those findings also were corrective and pre um, preventative actions that were documented. And I'm helping the team take those lessons learned from uh, Paragon 1 and in uh, incorporating those lessons learned into the GM1 mission flow. Um, and we want to do this with obviously without disrupting the, the GM1 schedule. Um, so we're doing this in a very deliberate way. Um, we're also looking at process improvements, uh, not only for GM1, for, but for all future missions. Um, what do I mean by that? We're, we're looking at various um, quality processes, procedures, technical drawing, release procedures, and so forth like that, um, where we're looking at streamlining those uh, and making them more efficient. Um, I do have a partner with that. With uh, You may recall that Frank Perry was uh, hired in the same day I was in April. Um, he is the director of engineering for landers and spacecraft. He has a 30 plus year career with NASA at Langley. And uh, he and I have been uh, doing a lot of uh, collaboration on, on those uh, process and procedure improvements. Um, so I, I, I hats off to Frank uh, helping us with that as well. Um, also, we've got um, astrobotic personnel um, at various supplier locations, helping to ensure that we keep on schedule. Um, and they've also been providing some additional oversight to ensure a greater level of accountability and control. Um, so as we move forward, we're going to continue to improve those processes. Um, I also want to talk just a little bit about um, the valves that, uh, that Sherrod did a great job of walking through uh, on Peregrine 1. So I'm sure all that are curious, what are the changes we're making to GM1? And so um, we have been working very closely with the vendor to redesign uh, the pressure control valves to address specifically the mechanical sealing flaw that we, we saw on PM1. Um, we have been testing these valves at the component level, and we've actually incorporated uh, a couple of new components in the GM1 system. We've incorporated a pressure regulator um, upstream uh, from the oxidizer and fuel systems. Um, so what that does is that's that's one way of mitigating the, the uh, single valve failure that we experience on PM1. So for instance, if 
If the pressure control valves failed in the similar way, this pressure regulator could be used to regulate the flow of the helium um, as a pressure. We also have installed uh, latch valves upstream of those pressure control valves as well. Um, so again, if we if we did see the same uh, failure mechanism on the pressure control valves, those latch valves would also be a way to control uh, the flow into the oxidizer and fuel tanks. Um, let's see. So I just wanted to kind of go back to the corrective and preventative actions being implemented as um, Sherrod went through. We, we had a total of 24 total in-flight anomalies on Peregrine 1. Um, the PCB2 failure, which was what we considered a catastrophic failure, is handled as a failure. Uh, one could say that those were actually 25, but we handled that separately. Um, of the 24 anomalies, eight were mission critical and potentially mission ending, but our, our excellent uh, mission operations team uh, handled those real time during the flight and resolved all of those. Um, there were additional five non-mission critical in-flight anomalies. Those were also resolved real time during the flight. And then the remaining 11 anomalies were assessed and deemed minor, and we analyzed those uh, post-flight um, and looked at those as corrective actions going into GM1. Um, so just keep in mind, again, uh, John Thornton mentioned this, this spacecraft flew successfully for 10 and a half days in cislunar space. Although we weren't able to uh, attempt a lunar landing, uh, we were able to increase the technology readiness level of just about all of our other systems, including avionics, our power systems, RF communications, and GN and C. So we actually were able to do the actual um, acceptance testing in a real, uh, real environment of cislunar space. And so now we bring those systems into uh, Griffin Mission 1, and we've tested those already in space, which provides us good heritage moving into GM1. So for um, in conclusion, uh, we have high confidence in our GM1 flow, uh, and we are looking forward to launching uh, GM1 no later by the end of next year. Olivia? All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Well, at this point, um, thank you, Astrobotic team and Dr. Horak for your comments today. And now we'll proceed to the Q&A portion. Um, now, for this to function, um, what you do is you add your question to the question queue uh, by messaging the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please include both your name and organization. And when it is your turn to ask a question, you, re you will receive a request to unmute your, unmute your mic. <laughs> so please accept the request to unmute your mic for us to hear you. Um, so you must, again, you must accept the request to unmute successfully. Um, so with that, let's start with Jeff Faust, Space News. You should be receiving the request to unmute now. Yeah, can you hear me? Absolutely. Great. <clears throat> Question, I think probably for Sherrod, um, as you went through that sort of the sequence of the <clears throat> valve replacement and, and testing and so on, did you do any testing of PCV2 after the spacecraft environmental tests? Um, cycling the valve, anything like that to, to see how it worked. Um, and if you didn't, would such tests have might have caught the problem um, before launch? Yeah, so once we finished acceptance testing, um, we, we did uh, operate the valves again, um, but not at full system pressure because we had to, um, we're still, uh, you know, we don't do the full system pressure until we go down to KSC and 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 load the propellant, load the helium, and all that. So, um, we didn't do it under full pressure uh, operating pressure uh, scenarios, but we did have a chance to uh, test the valves again under lower pressure. All right. Next up, we have Marcia Smith, Space Policy Online. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? We can. So um, my question is the technical root cause was the valve, but what was or were the other causes, schedule pressure, inexperience, other administrative or managerial issues, and what lessons are you drawing from that for the future? John Horak, do you, would you want to take that one?
Sorry, we're having just a, a technical difficulty unmuting a mic. <laughs> One moment. All right, John, you should okay. be unmuted. All right, thanks. Yeah, and good morning, Marsha. Um, you know, in in working with the team, um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, if you have a, a more robust piece of hardware uh, with multiple valves in place, and and I think Stephen Sherrod alluded to the changes that are coming for GM one. Um, you, 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 you could find a way to go forward. I, I really found that in looking at the team and in looking at what happened, there really, there isn't, there wasn't a point in the flow. Uh, you know, you sort of, you, you play the ground ball when it's hit to you. I would not have made any, I can't see any decisions that were made in the flow leading up to the launch where I would have said, Hey, you know, I think you should have done this differently. Every time there was a decision point to be made, you know, perhaps a launch date moved or something like that, um, you go through a major environmental test. Um, those decisions were pretty sound. So I think the decision making of the team was very good. Um, and so, you know, really, I think this is a situation where you had a pretty unfortunate piece of hardware that failed in the valve. Um, unfortunately, the design was such that if that valve uh, did fail and you overpressurize the tank, um, you have a very different mission with, uh, in this case, uh, loss of the opportunity to try to land on the moon. Um, as far as what's going to go forward in terms of the team and, and other things, then I, I think Steve talked about that. But I was very satisfied in having looked through, you know, the history. And actually, I was there the day they were the valve test failed uh, in Pittsburgh on the shaker table at pressure. Um, really, really happy about that. And I don't know that there were a lot of other mitigating factors that that led to the valve itself failing. Um, I take heart in the fact that, you know, when, when they flew, uh, the team saw several anomalies and fixed them on the fly. Um, and so, you know, going into GM1, uh, I personally, as an as a independent set of eyeballs, uh, am pretty, pretty confident that this team's going to be able to have a successful mission. This is Sherrod again. Uh, just to clarify a point on the on the valve testing, uh, what I spoke to was the testing that was done after the spacecraft had gone through full system acceptance testing, and really after that point, uh, that concludes the entire testing program, and and really you send the spacecraft to to launch for launch. But prior to that, in the development phase, uh, the typical approach is to determine which components in the spacecraft require. Uh, full acceptance and qualification testing uh, at the component level prior to even integrating those into the spacecraft, after which the spacecraft itself goes, goes through, as I mentioned, the, the leak and proof tests of the propulsion system, and then the vibe uh, acoustics, EMI, and, and thermal vacuum testing. So, so we did uh, do component level testing um, prior to integration uh, onto the spacecraft. And, and part of the decisions in which uh, components we choose to take through a full acceptance qualification program versus which ones we don't is really based on risk. And uh, in this case, we determined the risk uh, of that particular PCB2 uh, was low because it hadn't failed through any of the testing programs that we had gone through. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's also influenced by, by cost and schedule. And so that's how we made the decision to leave PCB2 as it was. Thank you, Sherrod. And a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question to the Q&A, please find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and submit your name and we'll get you in the queue. Uh, so next up, we have Anthony Colangelo, main engine cutoff. Hey, thanks. Um, trying to make sense from the post-mission report of uh, some of the timeline when it seemed like a, a series of things happened. You stated that you worked with the engine vendor, vendor to theorize that you could use the engine in this state with short pulses. But you also found out the trajectory was impacting Earth around the same time, um, which ended up being the safest option. But you did then still use the system quite a bit to move the impact point, um, even though the using the system was a risk that was identified by the mission. So I'm just trying to understand. It feels that that portion feels like a little muddled to me in terms of what order things happened in and how you got to the decision to make use of the system even in this state. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, Anthony. Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, we did, uh, the mission was planned as to have one phasing loop uh, going to lunar distance and then coming back around Earth before the final uh, approach to, to the moon. Um, 
we were having some challenges understanding the trajectory because of the of the leak and its impact on our on our trajectory itself. Um, and we had not fired uh, the main engines um, uh, in the early parts of the flight uh, because of the leak itself and the and the subsequent high mixture ratio that would be applied at those engines. When we reached Apogee, we started uh, and lunar distance, we started gaining more understanding of where our trajectory was taking us, and we realized that it was um, the leak had changed, perturbed the trajectory to where we would actually be impacting Earth as opposed to a, a 1500 kilometer perigee that we're predicting based on mission design. So at that time, um, as John mentioned earlier, we you know consulted with NASA and made the decision that um, we would go ahead and do a, a controlled reentry. Um, based on what our prediction was of where the spacecraft would uh, reenter, we we decided to um, try to fire the main engines um, to uh, alter that uh, alter that reentry point. And we did consult with the engine developer. And of course, at this point, the the mixture ratio of fuel to ox was going to be extremely high, uh, which would, uh, you know, way beyond the design limits. And so that would result most likely in the engine failing due to um, due to high high temperature. But we did talk to them and and found that uh, we could do some uh, quick pulses, which would prevent the engine from overheating very quickly. Uh, and so we uh, executed those quick pulses. Uh, the, the GNC and, and NAV teams and propulsion teams all work together to determine how many it would take uh, to alter our uh, entry reentry point uh, again over the South Pacific into a clear zone. So we executed those burns. Uh, after each burn, we would check the, the temperature of the engines uh, to, and let it cool down before we executed the next pulse. And out of that, we got a fair amount to Delta V that, uh, again, allowed us to re-enter at a certain point uh, into the South Pacific. And to clarify one point on the timing, this is John, uh, is around, around lunar distance was the time that we were, A, figuring out what's to do at the conclusion of the mission. So we were looking at, can we do a Delta V burn now uh, and avoid Earth, or should we let it go into Earth? So at that time, that's when we had established the procedures of um, doing short short uh, pulses for for the burning. So we we had the data then. We we felt like that could be a path, but uh, ultimately we made the decision to to come back to Earth for a safe reentry. All right. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Stephen Clark from Ars Technica. Hi. Thanks for doing this, uh, Stephen Clark, Ars Technica. I think my questions. Um, can someone kind of compare the propulsion systems on Peregrine and Griffin? I know Griffin is a much bigger spacecraft. Any differences in their architecture uh, between those two systems? And are there any more of these pressure control valves needed in that system? Or is it just these two, same number that was on Peregrine? And um, yeah, and th I think that's my main question. Just kind of compare the complexity of the two uh, propulsion systems. Thanks. Hey, Steve, this is Steve Clark, your, your alternate. <laughs> good, good to talk to you again. <laughs> um, so yeah, the system on on Griffin is different than Peregrine. Um, it's a larger spacecraft. It's a more complex spacecraft because it um, was designed to take heavier payloads. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that the changes we made to the system is, uh, of course, we have additional oxidizer and fuel on board Griffin since it's larger. Um, what we incorporated into the feed system design on Griffin is the regulator that I mentioned upstream from the oxidizer and fuel tank uh, pressure control valves. Um, and again, to, to eliminate the risk of that single point failure that we had on Peregrine. And we also incorporated what we call latch valves just upstream of each of the pressure control valves, one on the oxidizer side, one on the fuel side. Um, again, these are dissimilar valves, but they provide protection against that uh, fault that occurred on Peregrine 1. So we've actually improved the reliability of the propulsion system on Griffin. Um, larger tanks, uh, longer feed systems, obviously, because again, it's a larger lander. Um, but we've got increased reliability now in the system um, to mitigate against that single point failure. Perfect. Thank you. And up next, we have Evan, Evan, Evan Robinson Johnson from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Evan, you're on. 
Yeah, thank you guys so much for um, hosting this and taking questions. Shroud, I know you said the uh, Valve, Valve was a known risk. Um, did the review board and its assessment conclude uh, whether its failure was the result of how it was made um, you know, by the supplier or kind of that pre-flight um, list of actions that Astrobotic took? So it was um, a combination of, of design factors and, and testing. Um, as Steve, I think, alluded to, uh, the, the valve is undergoing changes uh, for the Griffin mission to be more reliable. Um, but did I answer your question? Evan, we're going to put you back on to make sure we answered your question appropriately. Yeah, all good. And and just, I guess the second part was like, with all of those changes that you've made, I mean, there's still concern about valves, right? And I'm um, just wondering what the likelihood is that we could see um, a very similar failure of a valve with Griffin. Hey, this is Steve Clark. Uh, we have been working with the vendor to redesign that valve, which we've done to address the particular um, seating issue that John Horak went into uh, detail on it, and I think Sherrod touched on as well. So the internal uh, design of that valve has changed, and we worked very closely to mitigate that same failure mode again to, to ensure that the valve will reseat whenever we cycle that valve. Um, so we think, we think we're in good shape there. And to add to that a bit more for, for Griffin, it is, uh, this is John, um, it is a single fault tolerant design uh, for Griffin. So that means that if that valve were to fail the same way as Peregrine Mission 1, um, there is a backup system that would be able to control the helium. That That is the latching valve that we, we added. Um, in addition to that, we even get additional control over the, the helium pressure from the from the regulator. So we've got one um, one fault tolerant and really like a, a little bit of extra support from that uh, pressure regulator. Thank you, John. Uh, we don't have any other Q and A's in the in the Q box. Um, so, oh, we did. We just did. So, Marsha Smith, um, if you, we're about to unmute you, and you can ask your question. Uh, thanks for giving me a second chance. And I just wanted to clarify. So, the valves on Griffin are the same valves as were on Peregrine, but you've added these regulators upstream to prevent the overpressure. Is that correct? And also, who is the vendor? And are there any more flights of Peregrine planned? Wow, all good questions, Marsha. This is Steve Clark. I'll address the first one here. Um, so the valves um, are different. As I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, we have worked to redesign the internal uh, workings of that valve to ensure that it, it reseats properly. So it is slightly different than the actual valve that flew on Peregrine. Um, the same vendor, but we've worked closely with them to redesign the internal workings. And then, as I mentioned, and, and John Thornton mentioned, we have the latch valves and the pressure regulator uh, that will eliminate the, the single point failure that occurred on Peregrine. Um, on your question about the vendor, we, we typically do not share, you know, all the different vendors that we work with. Um, just because we ultimately are responsible for the mission success um astrobotic is so uh on the third question yeah on the on the question about the future for peregrine and will it fly again um we we continue to uh pitch that lander for for opportunities for um, for future missions um one interesting scenario that we're looking at because it's now proven as a spacecraft uh in cislunar space is the potential for using it as a tug or using it as a, a alternate spacecraft bus um it's quite capable it, Flew ten and a half days in space. Avionics worked, battery worked, solar panel worked, um, com worked. The, the basics all worked, um, other than that uh, that valve failure. So um, uh, we feel very confident that it could be a fantastic uh, platform for future uses of other other mission profiles. This is Sherrod. I'll add that we're actively in talks with various customers to talk about those other types of missions that it could support, um, and. Given that we did operate for 10 days in space and we proved avionics, comms, power systems, uh, and our flight software, um, you know, all that all that hardware doesn't operate without a very robust and proven flight software uh, um, system. So, so that uh, that demonstrates to us that this is a very capable spacecraft that can uh, complete different types of missions. 
Yeah, one last thing too, I'll say our mission operations team uh, learned the hard way, but on the fly, and they're very experienced now on how to fly that spacecraft uh, in cis lunar space, even with an anomalous condition as well. So uh, the team is uh, well seasoned now. All right. And just a reminder, if you're just joining, I saw a few people join near the tail end. If you'd like to submit a question to the Q&A box, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. So up next for questions, we have Will Robinson-Smith of Spaceflight Now. Hi, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. And forgive me if this was asked earlier since I'm hopping in a little bit late here, but um, regarding Griffin Mission 1 um, coming up here, has Astrobotic manifested some additional uh, customers since uh, Viper was taken off? Or uh, how much time, I guess, is left for additional customers if there's uh, some further interest for them to be manifested between now and when that mission is hoping to launch? Thanks. So we're working through that right now. Um, we're continuing to, we, we have um, dozens of conversations about folks that have wanted to fly on, on Griffin. Um, some of those are more advanced than others, but uh, we're, we're, we're in active conversation on that. Um, I do want to point out that Griffin has active payloads uh, already, um, already baselined. And the first is our, our own Cube Rover uh, with a payload from a partner called Mission Control um, a Spacefarer in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency that's going to be flying. So there will be a small rover on this vehicle already. Um, and we're also going to be flying European Space Agency's LandCam X a NASA laser retroreflector array, uh, an additional payload that I wish I could talk about, which is way cool, but hopefully we'll be able to talk about it soon. Those are already manifested on the mission and were manifested prior to uh, Viper's removal. Um, now we have extra payload capacity. Um, we, we are uh, in conversations with multiple parties, as I mentioned, uh, for addition to flight uh, by, by 2025. Um, it's a short time frame. There's not a lot of uh, spacecraft that are ready to go that can be bolted on, um, and but we are talking to all of them about, about those options. All right. Thank you. And up next again, we have Jeff Faust from Space News. Hey, good morning. Question for um, Steve Clark. You've mentioned that the uh, there are eight other mission critical uh, anomalies during Peregrine's flight that were all resolved. I wondered if you could give any examples of of those anomalies and how they were resolved and how they might affect the uh, design or operations of Griffin. Hey, Jeff, I'm actually going to kick this over to Sherrod since he was the mission director and he's got much better insight. Sherrod. So, Jeff, those uh, they're a combination of uh, flight software, GNC. Um, uh, and we had one anomaly with the uh, with DSN itself. Um, those were resolved real time by the by the flight control team. They they modified software in some cases. Uh, some had to do with uh, failure detection, isolation, recovery procedures. Um, I can't go into too much detail without divulging too much about the the spacecraft itself. But um, again, those were all resolved real time, and those have been uh, all those lessons learned from those have been infused into into GM one as well. All right, and up next we have Stephen Clark again from Ars Technica. Hi, thanks for taking another question from me. Um, you know, us space reporters have been learning a lot about valves the last few months. I'm curious if someone can go into a little more detail about the actual you know, failure mechanism of this valve, what caused the sealant, the sealing surface not to seal properly? And what is the uh, material used in, in the sealing surface of this valve? Thanks. Uh, John Horak, I think we're going to open up your line to say a little bit more on that. Yeah, so the way I would think about this is, you know, you've got, as we said, a threaded component inside the valve. So you can think about, a you know, a, a screw and a washer or any any threaded component. And if you shake it sufficiently, you can get some changes in the in the mechanical configuration that will prevent the um, that will prevent the valve from sealing. And it's pretty much no different than when your sink starts to drip uh, in your kitchen. Uh, water gets through the through the the seal and and comes out the other side. In this case, it's helium and it's high pressure, so it's much harder to to confine. Um, so you know. We we actually did, as I think was mentioned by Sherrod, uh, we took a spare flight valve, we shook it to qual levels, we then put helium on it, and uh, after a, a, a moderate small number of cycles, you, the valve leaked, and you could hear it leak from about four feet away. Um, as far as the design of the valve goes, let me turn that back over to Sherrod so that he can give you some more information if, if that's permitted by uh, 
by the vendor and, and by the by the contract. Thank you, John. Yeah, this is Sharad. Uh, sorry, the, the the details of the design is is proprietary to that vendor, so we can't really speak uh, to that. All right. Up next, we have uh, Anthony Colangelo again from Main Engine Cutoff. Hey, thanks for the second round. Um, curious if you can give us any context with the Clips contract itself, um, with the way the mission ended. Were there milestones that the team missed out on, or what percentage of those did you receive based on the performance of the mission? Sure. So uh, first is that each one of the Clips missions that is awarded, there's about 10% of the milestones that are uh, based on success. Uh, and in this case, for, for Peregrine Mission 1, there were a series of, of success milestones. Um, we were able to collect, uh, uh, what would it be, 30% of that uh, success fee. And that was because we launched, because we operated in space, because we commissioned the spacecraft and it worked in space. Um, so we were able to uh, collect some of those. The next milestone would have been, I believe it was uh, orbit in lunar orbit. Um, that was the next one that we were not able to accomplish on, on this mission. All right. And next up, we have Kenneth Chang, New York Times. Great. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what is the key mistake here? Or is there a key mistake? So I was wondering, like, if you could jump in a time machine and sort of redo the decisions based on what you knew then. Is there a point where you should have made a different decision? Or is this the level of risk we should accept for a lower cost mission? Thank you. All right, we're going to open up John Horak's mic. Uh, one moment. Yeah, Kenneth, good morning. Thanks for the question. I'm looking forward to joining you on the Cardinals. My St. Louis Cardinals play the Yankees later this weekend in New York. Um, <laughs> as far as decisions go, my my assessment is no. I think the decisions that were made at each point in time were sound engineering decisions and sound programmatic decisions. Um, if you're going to ask me what I wish we had, I wish we had a more robust design of the valve. Um, and sometimes hardware just fails. And when a hard piece of hardware fails, you know, as, as was sp spoken about, PCV2 showed no sign of problems during the entire mission uh, pr prior, to the, prior to the launch. There was no indication there was a problem with the valve. There was no indication there was going to be a problem with its seating. PCV1 had its issues. They are the same design. Um, and, and Sherrod talked about why uh, they decided not to go in and do major surgery on the spacecraft. I think that was a very sound decision. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think you just stuff breaks. Um, and, you know, I'll leave it to, to John Thornton and others to talk about the nature of the design. But, you know, this, this is this is a lean forward, let's go fly kind of design mission. Um, you know, and, and while we're uh, new uh, redundancy, if you will, or backup is being added to Griffin. Um, you know, this is this is the Peregrine design. Uh, had the valve not failed, I would have been very optimistic about uh, being able to make some of those other milestones that John talked about, because the propulsion system, aside from the leak, you know, they were able to fly it. The comm worked, the battery worked, uh, GNC worked. Um, so this is this is, in my opinion, you just we had a piece of hardware break. Yeah, and to speak to that bigger question about. Uh, is this what we should expect for lower cost missions? I mean, we, we do have to keep it in context that this is this is not a multi billion dollar mission. This is uh, a mission profile that is new and it's it's a new form of it. And these are the first missions. It's it's a little bit like the first launch of a new launch vehicle in a commercial paradigm. Um, how many times have we seen a first launch fail? Uh, it's part of the development cycle. It's part of how we learn. It's part of how we get better as an industry. Um, another way to think about it is if is if you asked uh, you know a, a, a storied player like JPL to land on on Mars for a tenth of the cost, um, they would have to make some tough decisions on on risk and and program as well. Um, and that's basically what we're doing here is we're we're trying to do a mission at a price point that has never been possible before. And as such, we have to make uh, we have to make decisions on on where to focus and and how quickly we can get to launch. Um, and we're trying to balance that. And I think we got really, really close. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very confident that Griffin is we're, we're going to hit the the right balance. and We're going to have a uh, we're going to stick that landing and be ultimately successful. Great. Now, um, with that, John, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up the telecon? Oh, wait. Oh, we have one more question. We'll fit in. All right. Will Robinson Smith from Spaceflight now we're going to unmute, unmute you. 
Hi, thanks for squeezing in the time for one more question. Uh, just to follow up that statement from John, uh, maybe sort of as a step back and look at um, the CLIPS program overall, sort of given the information that you know now and, and the challenges of, of performing a mission like this at the the cost um, or the, the funds that you get from NASA, you know, if you could redesign CLIPS, do you think it would be wiser to, you know, put more money in each pot for each of the, the CLIPS providers to, you know, not have it be such a tight squeeze? Or do you think that, you know, now having one mission under your belt, you, you're able to sort of think about, you know, the, the risk management and some of the ways to reshuffle priorities to make it a more successful venture given the constraints moving forward? Thanks. I mean, first is that I, I think CLIPS is very successful just unto itself. I mean, we have, um, what is it? I think eight missions that have been manifested to fly to the surface of the moon. Um, and that is a just dramatic change. If you look back five years prior, um, uh, there were no missions manifested to go to the moon at that point. So it's a, a dramatic success in that case. Um, I could tell you from a, a vendor perspective, um, if there were uh, multiple missions manifested at the very beginning um, that would have helped um, create more stability uh, and and uh, I think improve the building up of the supply chain. Um, but you know, given where where we are with with the Clips program, we we have made great strides with that, and uh, I think we're I think the arrow is pointing in the right direction. Um, I know NASA is already thinking about Clips too, and and uh, uh, upgrades for for the next version of Clips, and I'm um, I'm optimistic that we're we're going to have a really bright future for the Clips program. Um, Steve Clark, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. <laughs> yeah, so just for a little background, I guess um, I was at NASA when we started this CLIPS initiative. And um, certainly it was, uh, I would say, a, a, a lean forward by NASA um, and to help jumpstart the commercial uh, lunar ecosystem. And I think it has done just that. I think, as John said, eight task orders have been uh, awarded, which is fantastic. Uh, as you move forward with a new initiative, though, you get lessons learned as you go along the way, right? And and I know we have talked with the CLIPS project office, as the other CLIPS vendors have as well, to provide them feedback on perhaps how to shape CLIPS 2.0 um, to make it even more successful. Um, I think NASA has learned a lot um, in these last um, five years, and certainly the CLIPS providers have as well. And I think we'll we'll come together on on how to to uh, shape CLIPS 2.0 to help uh, both NASA and the industry uh, move forward in a in a successful way. Um, but I'm I'm particularly excited um, watching not only Astrobotic but the other CLIPS providers. Um, Get these awards and and uh, take the opportunity to provide low cost commercial uh, lunar landing services to the nation, and so I, I look forward to seeing how the um, the next the rest of this year and next year not only Griffin uh, Mission One next year but but the other providers as well because um, I see a bright future for the for commercial lunar economy. Uh, we're at the very start of it. Uh, NASA's done a great job with industry on commercial LEO uh, moving ahead. And so now we're part of the next step on the lunar economy. So um, I think it's all good. I think we're moving in the right direction, as John said, that the arrow's pointing in the right direction. All right. And uh, John Thornton, do you have any other thoughts before we wrap up our telecon today? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody involved in the call today, um, especially John Horak, who, who uh, volunteered his time to help us with the independent review team. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of the team for a, a really thorough review. Um, I, I think it does look like the answer is is really the right one um, for what occurred with this mission. Uh, I think we've learned a lot through the course of, of the mission and that the review, um, flying it, uh, with mission control, all of the pieces. This is how we learn. Um, this is how we're going to get better as, as an industry. This is how we're going to get better as, a, as an individual vendor. Um, uh, and we're going to just keep focusing our development on Griffin Mission 1. Um, team is dialed in um, and using all the experiences and lessons learned from Peregrine Mission 1 to ultimately make Griffin a success. We are excited to be flying that uh, next year. 
and can't wait for that uh, euphoric high of a great launch uh, once again and the, the launch of another adventure uh, out to the surface of the moon. Um, so we're uh, we're excited and really, really um, looking forward to our next steps here. And I, I think this is just the very beginning of an industry. Um, as, as I mentioned, it's, uh, you know, uh, these first missions are, are like the launch campaigns. Five years from now, we're going to be looking back and saying, oh, well, you know, of course there was a failure or two, but now we've got this capability to fly to the moon for a fraction of what it would normally cost. And now we're talking about, okay, now let's build infrastructure on the moon. Let's build power on the moon. Let's build rovers on the moon. Um, let's uh, go for the resources and help support astronauts. That's where we're headed. Um, and uh, the Eclipse program is getting us there, and we're, we're excited for to be a part of that story. So thank you again for everyone uh, being a part of this, uh, the call today. Thank you, John. And uh, a reminder that the report detailing the mission and the re review board's findings can be found on our website at astrobotic.com slash press. If you have additional questions or you want to conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with any members of, of our briefing today, please contact us at astrobotic or press at astrobotic.com. Um, we will also be sending out a copy of the report via email to everyone registered on this account and to anyone signed up to our email list. Uh, thanks to everyone who submitted questions and thank you to everybody, every briefer that uh, joined us today to update us on the review board findings for Peregrine Mission 1. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.